This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Glad to have you here this morning as we've come to worship. And as if we didn't have to have enough trauma in our lives, we have now a water tissue here in Marion, Massapoiset, and uh, Rochester. I have some information uh, from Betsy, from the town uh, officials, about what to do with boiling water and such like that. And those who are homebound, some information there. If you'd like to see this afterwards, please let me know. Uh, there's also um, 10 cases of bottled water on my front porch. Well, your front porch, my front porch the, at the Parsonage. Uh, you're certainly welcome to that. Uh, Helen told me that she would come get some, but she can't do that. And so please let me know. I'll be happy to take it and put it in your car for you. Um, and I'll be even happy to take it into your house if you want me to drive over there as well. But we have 10 cases there. We have another case in the churches or in the um, office building. And we have more than that um, elsewhere. So please let me know if you do need that. But we're also collecting money for church mums. Apparently one of the things that you guys do is put mums on the front porch here. Um, so here's your last Sunday to uh, sign up. I have some extra forms if you need them as well. And I wanted to remind you that we have a change for change. And I noticed that some people have put some in quiet money. That's really good. Um, and this is something for Heifer International. So it's always there. Uh, we decided to take the, the top off, not that you take the money, but you put money in. So please do that afterwards. It's always in the narthex for you. And today, one of your former pastors is with us. Uh, Bob McFarland is here. I think it's uh, really smart of you to tell Al that you're coming at, at 8 o'clock last night so that there was no danger of us saying, please come and preach for us on that Sunday. And I know she didn't call me too. I would have uh, tried to argue that. But we're glad to have you, um, um, Bob. It's good to see you again. And um, Jeannie, uh, uh, Lindsay, are we having a fellowship time afterwards? Yes, outside in nature. Okay, then uh, you'll need a little faith myself. All right, so we'll be having our regular fellowship time out back or out front. All right, those are our announcements. Let's prepare our hearts for worship.
have one more announcement. <clears throat> Sally is in the hospital and we have a card out front for you to sign uh, as you go out. So please do that. We'll have more information later on as if you want to know more about that. Our call to worship is found in your Bible. It's uh, Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God, as he has made us. We are his, and we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his activity and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in your eternity and gift of faith that we may see the God that's nigh and reaching the earth that what lies ahead. <clears throat> may we follow the way of your commandments and that shape by them as our passing God. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first hymn is hymn number 84 in your red and blue hymnals. Oh God, our help in ages past. Those who are able, please stand and we will sing. Reading this morning from the Old Testament lesson, Genesis 12, verses 1 to 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram 
was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. The epistle lesson is from the Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from, our, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. The gospel reading is found in the first chapter of John's gospel. The scene is one in which uh, John the Baptist is out preaching and two of the form, uh, future disciples of Jesus, Andrew and John, are following along. They hear Jesus or John point out Jesus and say, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The next day, we come up with this verse, starting with verse 35, and we'll read through the 45th, 42nd verse. Let's listen to the word of God. The next day, John was there again with his two disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard this, him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. And so they went and saw where he was staying. And they spent the day with him at about the 10th hour, which is about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two that heard John, as he had said, and heard who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was go to find her, his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas which when translated is Peter. May God add his blessing to this, the reading and hearing of his holy word. of my mouth and the meditations of all our sight of may the meditations of all our hearts be blessed in your sight for it's in Christ's name we pray amen now many of the things you've heard about me are true especially what you've heard about the fact that I have a descendant I am a descendant of the Mayflower John Howland was my descendant. And I have that ancestor. I have, by my reckoning, either 12th or 13th generation American. I've wanted to fill out my census form saying Native American, but I know that means something else. I grew up in a congregational church, and my father's favorite day was Founders Day. It was a congregational church that actually had a picture of the Mayflower on their front uh, sign outside. We're very proud of this fact. And my father was very proud of it. He wore a big 
button that said, I am one of them, or something to that effect. But he loved the fact that he was part of the Mayflower people and the pilgrims. Now, I have thought that serving in a congregational church would really got me some more pay because I'm a Mayflower descendant. That's never happened. I think the reason is I've been doing most of this in New England, where most of my congregation are Mayflower descendants as well. So they want to tell me things like, so what else is new? Don't get a big head on yourself about yourself. One of the favorite trips that we would do with our, with our families was to take them to Plymouth Plantation, and which I think they do a fairly good job of playing, acting the uh, various characters in eight, uh, 1627. Uh, Martha and I have always tried to get those playing those characters off their game, see if they'll mess up or say something weird. So one time Martha introduced our son Isaac, who was just a little boy at the time, as one of Elizabeth Howland's great, 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 great grandsons, to which she said, Madam, I think you have a problem, because I don't know what you're telling me. And we couldn't get her off her game. But you know about those pilgrims, but they didn't call themselves pilgrims. If they called themselves anything, it would be separatists, which is something that's still a spirit in our congregational system. We love the fact that we are autonomous. No one can tell us what to do. It's all about us. And we still do that even to this day. So we're separatists, but they didn't call themselves pilgrims. If they did identify themselves other than, than that, it would have been saints and strangers. You know that they left England and went to the Netherlands because of the restrictions of their religious practice that was keeping them from worshiping the way they wanted to, not having uh, the pastors that they wanted, and et cetera. And they did pretty well in uh, the Netherlands. But after about 10 years or so, they found that their kids were raising up being more Dutch than English. <gasps> what a horrible thing. So they decided to go to the new world. Now I'm sure that my ancestor, John Howland was considered one of the strangers. Why? Because he was an indentured servant of John Carver. Carver was to be the governor of this new plantation. And so that first winter when he and his whole family passed away, guess who got the inheritance? It's good being John. John Howland got it all. And I'm convinced that at some point he may have been considered a saint. At least that's what I hope. I know that he became the first lawman of the Plymouth Colony. He was their constable. But the term saints and strangers is strange to us. And yet I think it's still something that's very true even today. If you were asking people who walk along the streets, why didn't you come to the church? You might say, well, that's not my church. And you may ask them, well, what church do you go to? And they may have a hard time coming up with something. But what they are saying is that they're really a stranger. They don't belong there. I've had people come to me uh, from different traditions and even here and ask permission of whether or not they can come. And without... Uh, well, I try not to laugh, but I try to tell them, yes, you're always welcome to come. It says all who are welcome, you can come. But there are people who are strangers to us. And this, the term saints is not something that we use quite often either. Saints is something that the Catholic Church does. They make people saints, right? Well, in the term that Paul uses, as he describes the people in Ephesus, is saints. Those saints who live in Ephesus who are part of the church. And so this, these words, saints and strangers, are not used, uh, something that we're used to. Now, a stranger was one who was part of the group, but was not one who had 
just uh, that shown evidence of grace in their life. That's the way the Plymouth group would have said it. The process for them and still is for us taking strangers and bringing them into sainthood. In a sense, we were all strangers at one time. In fact, that's what the whole Bible's about. Ever since we were, our forefathers and foremother was banished from the, from the garden, we've been a stranger to God. And yet God is trying to woo us back and not make us strangers, but make us part of his family. And this is still true today. Now, some of us are, think we are strangers to the church because we never went to church. We don't know what church is all about. And so we're a stranger to it. Or we may have been, had a bad church experience. And that makes it very hard to come back into a church. And we're very happy to be a stranger to the church now because they have been so terrible to us. Others of us grew up in the church. We always have been here. It's just like what we do. And we may have been a stranger maybe in the nursery, but it wasn't long before we were part of the people of God. So this morning, I would like to talk a little bit about this process of going from being a stranger to a saint. How does that happen? In our text this morning, we have a couple of ways it does happen. And thank you, Judith, for reading for us. Abraham, in the Old Testament lesson, Abram, who will become Abraham, is 75 years old. He's married. He doesn't have any children. And God calls him and Sarah as strangers, if you will, not people of faith, but strangers, to go where he's telling him to go. He says, go to a place where I will tell you. They should be looking for retirement property at 75. They should be finding a nice beach somewhere to plant themselves and wait for the coming eschaton. And it is clear that they are strangers from God. And yet God tells them to go, but go where? That must be what they were thinking. Where are we going to go? But listen to what God says. Go from your country and to the kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. <laughs> show you? Just get in the car. I'll tell you. We'll, we'll show you where we're going. If you want to go, I, I'm not so sure. But he says, yes, I have place for you. There, there's, no, there's no triptych. There's no glossy brochure that tells, it shows all the nice amenities of this place you're going to go. There's no well-produced PowerPoint to get you to accept this offer to go where God is telling you to go. There's no place like that. Just go and trust in faith. But God gives them a little bit more. He says, here's some of the things you can believe in. God tells them what he's going to do. He says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the ones who curse you, I will curse. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Wow. So he's going to be a blessing. He's going to be blessed. He's going to be the ancestor of a great nation. Well, that's really nice, but that's not something he's going to see. But he's going to make his name great. Now we have the thought of make, making a name for yourself, which means that other people outside those people who actually know you, know your name. So make your name great. And we're not sure exactly what that would mean for Abraham, but God clarifies by saying, so that you will be a blessing, that to know Abraham is to be blessed. And God is going to bless those who bless you. Wow, that sounds pretty good. 
So those who bless me get blessed. Oh, it's good being me. All right, great. That's a that's a wonderful blessing. And also those who curse you, I will curse. He doesn't doesn't say that God is calling Abraham to curse them, but he would curse them. And we know that God's curses do have a oh, shelf life. They do work. God concludes by saying that uh, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. This is a this is the takeaway for us. Because like Abraham, we are we were strangers at one time with God, but we are no longer strangers, and we are called to bless people, bless those around us. Now, as I look around, some of you are uh, about the same age as Abraham. Some of you are a little over that. And you're wondering, I'm not sure I want to get in the car and just go anywhere to someplace I don't know anything about. I'm not sure I want to have this blessing of Abraham that you speak of, Pastor. And most of you women are not ready to see the blessing of Sarah as a blessing, but a curse. Having a baby at an elderly age? No. They may get you in the papers, but that's the last thing I want to be is in the papers for something like that. But many of you have dropped not so subtle hints that you're not sure you want to continue doing the full-time job that you're doing at the church. You really were looking forward to these autumn years of your life. It's a little error now. Not people calling you up and asking you to do various things or take care of various things or leaving you long voicemails. You will be here at 9.30 to help me. Things like that. However, let me suggest something. First is that your great age doesn't give you a chance to get out of things. Penalty box. See, Moses was 80, Abraham 75. This is where people actually start to really take care of and do what God wants them to do. So be like Moses, be like Abraham, and be a blessing. But not only be a blessing, the problem, the thing that we're into here, this process we're into. And your, and your um, participation in it will leave a legacy long after you're gone. In fact, you will be a blessing for people who are not here yet. You will be a blessing for people who have yet to be born as we do this correctly and well. And this could be the most greatest and most fulfilling accomplishment of your life as we go through this process. Now, beyond that, being a saint, remember that you're also a member of the church. And you have a job, and the job is to bless those around you. So how do we do that? Well, you do it like Betsy did this week. I was down with Martha uh, for a memorial service for my aunt. And one of the first phone calls I got was from Betsy reminding me or telling me about the uh, water problem here in uh, Marion and not to drink the water, not to uh, do anything with the water except for boil it for a good minute or so. And then she told me that not only was she going telling me a, the warning me, but she then blessed me. She let me know that her son, Brian, was going to come over with some cases of bottled water. So I figured yeah, a couple of cases of bottled water is what he'd show up with. No, he had a whole pallet of bottled water in his truck. I'm glad he did not unload it all there, but we have a lot of water. It was a whole pallet. That's a lot of water. And so I want to remind you, there's water on the porch for anyone who wishes to have it. 
So if you need someone to help you with that, uh, I have some help today. My son Isaac is here. He can take two of them at once. It's not like me just doing one at a time. So please let us know. Betsy and Brian have been a blessing to us in this regard. They're doing what Father Abraham taught them to do, to be a blessing for those around them. But also, I would like to suggest that you start to look for opportunities to bless. To look and watch your neighbors, take not, not to become a, a, a spy, but to be considerate and concerned for them. And when you see a need and you feel that you can take care of that need, to do that and be a blessing. And being called part of the way, the God that is blessing, this is a way to make strangers into saints. One way is through blessing. Another way is through invitation. That's what Brother Andrew did with Peter. Listen to what, he, what happens. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And we have, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you Simon, you're son of John, but I'm gonna call you Cephas, which when translated means Peter. The first thing Andrew did was to go tell Simon. To go tell Simon, his brother, we have found the Messiah. Simon agrees to go and meet the Messiah. And Simon does meet Jesus, and Jesus gives him a new name. This is how it's all done. Most people whom you have around you are waiting to be invited to come. I will tell you something that's very interesting. Pastors are really bad at this. It's not because I don't know how to invite people. Don't get me wrong. I know how to do that. But they feel like, well, he's paid to do that. He just wants more pay. You know, you get more people coming, you get more pay. That's what they think. It doesn't always happen that way, but I'm, that's what they think. But when people who are their friends say, would you come with me? Would you come and visit? I'll come with you. I think you'd like it. Then they often will come. Someone told me that they have a friend who they've been talking about what we're doing here and getting them ready for some Christmas ex extravaganzas that we have planned or are still in the talking stages. And that's how you do it is we know that they like to be a part of that. The other day I was in the general store. I was I had just come through with the Terrell family, giving them an idea of what the church looks like. Many of them had been here, some of them hadn't. Show them where the um, Memorial Garden and where the plaque will be for um, uh, Truman. And, um, I, and I dismissed, I said goodbye to them and walked into the, um, the general store. The gentleman figured out very quickly that I must be the new pastor in town. I said, I am. And we got chatting about the church and such. And then before I left, I said, and you're always welcome. 10 o'clock, we're always open on Sunday. You can come. Now, I don't know if he will ever come because I know if some of you ask him to come, he won't come is you're better at this than I am. But to be invited is what we're talking about. That's how strangers become saints. So if we take like Andrew, inviting friends and neighbors and relatives, we will find that people will, become, will no longer think of themselves as strangers, but as parts of the church. And looking for other people, how to bless those around you so that they understand that you're doing this because you really care about them. Not whether or not they come, just that you take care of them. 
Now there's one more important way other than just blessing and inviting. And that is this understanding that coming into the family of God is that you are adopted. Paul writes in his introduction to Ephesians, he destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that freely bestowed on us in the beloved. The plan here is that we have been adopted into God's family as God's children. Now, some of you are adopted children and you grew up in good, solid families. Some of you have adopted children and have given them good and solid families. But adoption is a decision that the parents make for the child to take the child in. Adoption at the time of Paul is a little different because it was a lasting commitment. You see, the biological child could be disowned in the Roman world. Adopted child could not. Once you're adopted in the family, you are part of the family. There's no way out of the family. And that's what he's mentioning here is that we've been adopted into the family of God. There's no way out because God has brought us into his family. We're part of the family. In a strange way, when we have our own biological uh, children and part of our uh, biological family, we become part, uh, we are always part of the uh, family. This past week, when I was with uh, some cousins, a uh, new cousin that we hadn't met before, uh, one of my cousin's daughters was there, and she was saying uh, with a smile, I'm becoming to understand that I am my father's daughter, that many of the things that he does, I do as well. And we all smiled at her and said, well, that's part of growing up, is making peace with the fact that we thought we got far away from the family, but we're still carrying a lot of the family with us. And I know the same thing. As a young man, I wanted to be different than my father, but then I realized the face in the mirror is looking a lot like dad. And I look down at my hands, I go, there's dad's hands. How did that happen? Well, I'm Fred Woodward's father, son. That's the way it is. So going from a saint or a stranger to a saint has the benefit of being adopted into the family of God. Let's remember these things as we go out and take care of those around us. It's nice to claim that I'm a descendant of the Mayflower, but really, who cares? Because I was told by Al, he's a fifth generation of this town. Okay, well, you win that. We go on. It just means something that there are some famous people on our famous family tree. There's some infamous people in the family tree. As one of my deacons said, if you look at your family tree too long, you'll find someone hanging from it as well. Well, maybe true enough. But the good news today is that whether you think you are a stranger or a saint, the truth is God wants you to be adopted into the family of God. That is the good news. So whether you're a saint, stranger, or know that you're adopted, your job still is to take care of and bless those around you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have given us. We pray your blessing upon us as we now go forth to serve. We pray these things in Jesus' name. 72 in our hymnals, in the blue hymnals, Great is thy faithfulness. Let us stand together and say,
return to prayer. Take the first few moments for our own silent prayers, and then I will have a chance to uh, pray for ones that you would like to pray for. Pray out loud, and we will say amen to your prayers. And then now we'll lead us in a time of prayers for the people that we have listed. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have given us. We thank you that you are in the process of bringing all of your creation back to you. We pray that you would help us to be the blessings that you want us to be. We thank you for blessing us. And we thank you for being a blessing to us. And may we continue to be a blessing to all those around us. We pray that you would be with us in this church and in this communion and this fellowship. We pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us, be with those who are hurting in our midst, be with those who are sick in our midst. We ask that you would be with each and every one. We pray especially for the Terrell family as they have met together this week to memorialize uh, Truman. We ask their blessing us as they mourn this dear man. We thank you for our chance to be a blessing to them. And now we pray that you hear the prayers of your people as they pray. We gather today with gratitude for the gift of God's constant presence. Let us now offer to God our prayers those things that weigh heavy on our hearts. For healing and restoration, Pat, Phineas, O, Iris, Shirley, Michael, Anne, Thomas, and Rose. Susan, the family of Anna, the Walsh family, John, Phyllis, Grace, Carly, and Deb. For those in a nursing home, Eleanor, Shirley, Sonia, Ken, Marilyn, and Michael, and Holly, and Kenzie, and Carol, and Bill. For those in the military who protect and defend the freedoms that we all enjoy. Bill, Robert, Sarah, and Paul. Now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn response is 400 or 48 in your blue hymnals. Immortal, invisible, only wise God. Let us stand together and say. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you. 